Hello, this is Roger Lamb. I'm so thrilled to be able to make another presentation to the Global Connect class uh, of all the students in our missions training schools around the world. Uh, you inspire me. You give me hope and uh, faith for the future as it really lays out before us and honoring God around the world. I've been asked to share about how our story connected into the ICOC story, and uh, I've been able to be blessed to be uh, tell the story of the ICOC uh, ever since the early 90s. And uh, my roles as uh, director of uh, KNN, before that, I published our magazine. Boston Bulletin, the LA Story, Disciples Today, etc. So this is something very special to my heart and important for us to tell our story and pass our story on to other generations. So I'm going to share some things with you today that will give us some personal insight and an overview of our movement. Um. I believe that we should always look at this as our his story in our story. You know, his story is that Jesus built the church. Without him, none of this makes any sense or is possible. He bought us with his blood. He's the head of the church. He works through the Holy Spirit in us. The Father is always there uh, comforting and, and directing and condoning as well. Uh, and of course, we've got to remember God's vision for this group of disciples. And by the way, these were things I was taught growing up as principles or facts. Um, disciples of all nations, uh, neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, male or female, you're all one in Christ. Uh, it is part of the kingdom of God come to earth. Uh, the church is the family of God, chosen people, royal priesthood, holy nation, God's special possession. Uh, we are the body of Christ. We are of every nation, tribe, people, and language uh, that's going to be in heaven. This is how it happens, is when we take the gospel to these places, we'll see people from all these places in heaven. That's just amazing. Then, of course, uh, in the first century, you saw the expansion in the scriptures of the gospel around the world, the known world. And then uh, the, the church fathers come after that. Then uh, Catholicism takes over and Eastern Orthodox Christianity splits off about 1,000. Then in the 1500s, the Reformation movement decides we need to get away from this Catholicism and get back to more of the essence of Christianity. Then the 1800s, as you heard from Steve Kennard last week, uh, there was a real strong uh, movement to restore the original church. And that's the uh, segment that I also grew up in, came out of. The restoration movement, uh, just a summary, 1800, 1850 was in the UK and USA. In the 1860 to 1902 or so, the US churches divided north and south. Uh, and the over instruments. Uh, 1903 to 1950, they divided into the Disciples of Christ, the Independent Christian Churches, Churches of Christ. And then 1950s, the Churches of Christ went through a strong evangelism and missions. That's actually when I was growing up in the 50s um, and uh, before high school and, and college. Um, the International Churches of Christ history starts in 1960s with the campus evangelism movement, in the 70s, the Crossroads movement, the 80s, the Boston movement, 90s ex expansion of ICOC 1.0, we'll call it, and uh, then 2004 to 2018, the cooperation phase, 2018 till today, collaboration phase. Um, then you can go on icochistory.org and see the media. And there's a great video uh, published in 2010 that goes through this in video format. My connection with all of this was um, that I grew up in the Churches of Christ. 
Uh, my, my mom actually was baptized when I was four. Uh, my dad grew up uh, very nominal, but became stronger and stronger as I got older. And then I went to Harding College in uh, Searcy, Arkansas, a Christian college of the Churches of Christ that had at that time had sent out half the missionaries uh, of the Churches of Christ. Um, so it was a very exciting time. I remember some of my best friends were kids who had grown up in Africa as children of missionaries and learning from them and being inspired by them. Uh, we went on campaigns in the summertime. I, uh, my wife, and Marcia, and I met there at Harding, and we would go uh, to the campaigns northeast, throughout the northeast U.S., and uh, door knock all summer, 12 weeks, uh, three weeks in each city. We door knock six days a week asking people to study the Bible. And we saw a lot of people become Christians and get baptized, although not many of them stayed uh, because of the approach we methods we were using. But that really uh, helped me solidify my own convictions by having to study the Bible with so many people uh, and uh, people that knew things I'd never heard of before. Um, but this time in our uh, history in the U.S. was a time of incredible unrest on U.S. campuses. The, there was the Vietnam War, there was the Civil Rights Movement, there was so many issues that the country felt like it was tearing apart. And then there was a lot of revolution thought going on. There was the Jesus people starting and and the Jesus revolution and, and all these kind of things to counteract this uh, countercultural thing that was going on. And uh, part of that was the Campus Crusade and Varsity Navigators Fellowship, uh, Fellowship of Christian Athletes, et cetera, grew up as a Christian answer to those uh, issues. Um, the campus evangelism in the Churches of Christ was very weak at that point. And... Uh, uh, frankly, most of the kids were encouraged to go to Christian colleges uh, to save them from the world and to find a, a Christian mate. Um, and so it, it was it was pretty thin. But then some of our leaders in the Churches of Christ were inspired by this movement to go and address the cultural issues head on with the gospel. And so the campus evangelism movement began in the main line. Churches of Christ. Um, when I was a sophomore in college, I went to the first meeting of the campus evangelism seminars. It was called Solution Revolution in 1996 in Dallas, Texas. Uh, my best friend and I roomed there, and uh, it just was so inspiring and blew my mind. The uh, speaker was Bill Bright, head of the Campus Crusade, and he called on us to be spiritual revolutionaries and just was so inspiring in so many ways. Um, so that, that was my introduction there to the campus things. And then as we saw the years go on, unfortunately, as uh, uh, Steve mentioned, the uh, uh, Churches of Christ shut down the campus evangelism movement. But there was one bright light that continued out of that, that movement, and that was the Crossroads Church of Christ. Uh, Chuck Lucas, evangelist, Sam Lang, campus minister, and then uh, they had a vision for uh, having a campus ministry on every U.S. campus in uh, uh, the United States uh, as a part of the existing Churches of Christ. They trained multitudes of young men and women, Kip and Elena McKean, Wyndham and Jeannie Shaw, Bruce and Rob Williams, Tom and Kelly Brown, Sherwin, Debbie McIntosh, et cetera. It was just an amazing ministry. I was hearing about it through their bulletin uh, at the time in the 70s. The Crossroads Movement wound up restoring these biblical teachings. Jesus is Lord, not just Savior. He's Lord and Savior. Um every Christian to be evangelistic, one another relationships. That was not really stressed in the Churches of Christ. In fact, I was advised as a young minister 
uh, in the churches of Christ to not build many close relationships. Then the indwelling of the Holy Spirit was radical. Uh, too many of the churches of Christ people uh, oppose that. In fact, when I was a youth minister in this wealthiest church in Houston, uh, the, the only time the minister studied the Bible with me was to prove to me that the Holy Spirit did not dwell in us personally, but only through the Bible. And he used Romans 8, and which deepened my conviction about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and I'm so grateful for what others have taught and helped me because the Holy Spirit has guided us through a lot of storms through the years. Um, the other thing that, that they reestablished was loving all people, uh, having interracial marriages, uh, baptizing people of all nations. Uh, our churches, the churches of Christ are still separated pretty much into white churches of Christ and black churches of Christ, although they've been talking together more, but it's still not uh, uh, very often that they even worship together. Um, well, how did I fit into this? Well, in 1976, I was in that youth ministry in Houston, Texas, and a guy came along and said, we need a minister for this little church in Charleston, Illinois. We just built a brand new building. The biggest campus uh, freshman dorm is right there behind the building, and uh, we need a minister. We haven't had one for decades. And uh, something, frankly, I believe is the Holy Spirit said, you need to do that. So I volunteered. We moved there. Uh, 10,000 residents, 10,000 students, this little bitty town in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and I just knew that God wanted us to, to grow this church. How do we grow it? I don't know. Interesting sub-fact, when we were there, I found out from my grandfather that my great-grandfather had preached for the same church from 1894 to 1898. I had no idea he was even a preacher. Um, so that was an amazing uh, time. And God, yes, you need to be here. And then we got to talking to my wife's mother who grew up nearby and she said oh yes i remember old brother lamb he baptized my dad so my great-grandfather baptized my wife's father uh he, none of us you know knew that uh it, it was amazing so but our conviction was how are we going to grow the church how are we going to change lives i was going to every conference I could find, trying to get answers, bus evangelism, soul winning workshops, et cetera, et cetera, and uh, just trying to get the answers. Um, so here we were in Harry's Chapel Church of Christ in Charleston, and I got, uh, I saw the church grow. We doubled in a few years, and it was mostly students, but I really didn't know what to do with them. I didn't know because I'd see them leave the the campus years and then not go to church or go back to their denomination or whatever. And I was like, you know, I, I need a campus minister to help me figure this out. So God led us to interview Tom Brown first, which we wanted, but he went on to Boulder. And then we hired Kip and Elena McKean as campus ministers in 1976. Um, that was amazing. And Kip did a very wise thing. He challenged me to go to the Florida Evangelism Seminar that year, and I went and I saw what he was trying to build. So I saw all those things I mentioned about the campus ministry movement at Gainesville. That was what I'd been taught the church should be my whole life, but I'd never seen it all put together. I was so inspired and happy, and then I had to also make my own decision that I was not totally committed to Jesus, and that I was a big part of the problem. So I got up in front of the church and apologized and confessed and asked for forgiveness and recommitted or committed to put Jesus Lord of my life and to seek first the kingdom and then challenge them to do the same. And God just blessed all of that on and on. I mean, we had hundreds baptized each year in this little town. Uh, we only, building sat about 300. We baptized 150 in one of those years. 
And uh, then many, many others were raised up to go in the ministry uh, out of there, including Marty Fuqua and Martin Chris, Mark and Connie Mancini, and, and many others. Um, in 1979, Kip moved to Boston, which was, you know, 300,000 students in that area. And what, what an ama amazing thing, opportunity. Then the Boston movement started. And so uh, that was 1980 to 90, when the Boston church was really leading the way. These are the things I see that they really restored. Unity and leadership. Uh, that was something that was not common in the uh, churches of Christ. Uh, planting new churches. Who plant churches? That just was a foreign concept. Uh, pillar church cities around the world, to, following the New Testament pattern of what Paul did in his missionary journeys. Thousands converted, hundreds from the churches of Christ and Christian churches who were hungry and looking and searching to see the New Testament church and saw this happening, and they moved. They quit their jobs, sold their homes, and moved to Boston, to Chicago, San Diego, and other Atlanta, and other places to be a part of this going on. Uh, world mission seminars started in Boston. We had had regional seminars. Our one in Chicago grew to 4,000 people. But the, the core seminar was the Boston Mission Seminar, and things uh, really progressed from there. I'll never forget standing by Jim Blau at the Boston World Mission Seminar the first time we took up a million dollars for missions. It just was... Uh, chilling and spine tingling uh goosebumps a moment it was awesome um and here's what i think the boston movement restored biblical teachings going into all the world discipling relationships jesus vision of all nations and races races faith over fear sacrifice and serving the poor So the Boston Church has planted over 54 church plantings. There's more than this. This only goes up to 2016. And they're still doing it. Um, so the ICOC uh, expansion happens next. Uh, with the McKeans and the Bairds moving to L.A., L.A. becomes the center point of the movement and for the next decade. The goal then uh, that was pronounced in the evangelization proclamation was to plant a church in every nation with a city over a hundred thousand. Then 1991, Hope Worldwide to lead in our serving the poor. 1993, our name changed because the churches of Christ asked uh, that we not be included with them anymore in the uh, uh, national records of uh, churches. Uh, John Vaughn, who kept those, called called me and said, what, what should I do with this? And I said, well, what would you call us? And he said, International Churches of Christ. I said, let me ask people, and everybody liked it. Uh, 1994, Kingdom News Network started so that we could tell the story of the rapidly expanding churches, et cetera. And so I got to start a, a media uh, company in Hollywood, uh, for our churches globally and tell the story. So if you haven't looked through those Kingdom News Network videos, I think you'll find them really inspiring. Uh, they're old quality, but don't let that ruin it for you. There's amazing content in there. Um, and then of course, in 2000, we had a jubilee to celebrate the amazing things that God had done by then. You can see on this graph, the growth in the number of churches and the number of nations that were uh, being planted. And there's just pictures from around the world showing, uh, and this just thrills me a lot. I also was thrilled at the raising up of national leaders. Uh, I was told in, in college, in missions training, that uh, it would take like 10 years to raise up a local to be a, a, a minister. Our people were doing it in one, two years, et cetera. It was just 
phenomenal. And of course, most all of our churches around the world are now led by nationals and have been since early their early days. Um, 2003, of course, we had our crisis with God's discipline. Uh, everything shut down. We lost our organization. We lost uh, uh, everything, uh, the funding, third of our membership, uh, most of our staff, the collections went down, all this kind of stuff happened. The uh, that's, And we can focus on those things, but I, I think the important thing is to see what, what God worked in people. I do believe it was God's discipline because he corrects those he loves. We went, uh, we repented of one man authoritarian leadership, moved to team leadership, evangelist elders, teachers leading together. We uh, repented to be loving and healthy, renounced harshness, sales techniques, etc. We reestablished Jesus as truth and grace. Before that, grace was very seldom discussed. Um, each church came in charge of its own finances, which solved a lot of problems. Caring for the weak, more attention on shepherding, addiction, purity, grief ministries, etc. And then Bible education for ministers, which was discouraged before that, and now is very encouraged among all of our people. It was cool to see us as a movement actually show godly sorrow. When this all happened, I saw these valiant heroes around the movement apologizing for things that they had done and things that other people had done before they ever got there. Uh, it was a corporate repentance as well as a personal repentance. And it was so humbling. And I, I really believe that's why God held us together. There was a moment in 2004 when uh, I wondered if we would ever even make it as a movement. We were this close to just dispersing. And I believe my conviction is that because our leaders repented that God kept us together and kept us going. So then uh, I looked around and I saw our churches did had no way to connect with each other, no way to communicate. And uh, I was like, if we don't communicate, if we don't even know where our churches are, we are doomed. So on faith, I stepped out and started disciplestoday.org and then had to reconstruct our list of churches from scratch around in 150 countries. And some great faithful brothers and sisters helped uh, do that. And then we started putting out little videos. We started a website, et cetera. Uh, in 2005, the initiation came to have this cooperation agreement because we had to decide, how are we going to function now? And uh, uh, here's, uh, you can still get the uh, copy of the, the Plan for United Cooperation in multiple languages on the icocleaders.org site. Then in 2007, uh, once most of the churches had agreed to cooperate, they came together in a really inspiring delegates meeting and establish service teams to minister to different areas, uh, missions, evangelists, elders, teachers, communications, benevolence, uh, it's the youth and family, et cetera. And that still continues today. Um, so from 2007 to 2018, we basically had a lot of cooperation uh, commitment there are regional family meetings, our regional families of churches. In 2012, it was such an incredible thing when uh, the World Discipleship Summit was held in San Antonio. 16,000 people came together and literally wept when the singing started and when the flags of the nation started coming in. It was a special moment. And the message everybody felt was, oh, my gosh, we're still here. We're back. In 2016, we had a continental conferences in Indonesia, China, Europe, South America, Africa, and in St. Louis, we had 18,000 attend that. Uh, 
And of course, in 2022, we had the WDS in Orlando. Great symbols of health and uh, passion in our people. Just to help you understand, in 2018, uh, we already had grown back to 23% since 2007. Um, we had 689 churches globally. 40% of them were in North America. And this is still true. Most of our churches are outside North America. Uh, 2018, uh, ICOC 2.1 started, uh, 675 churches, 144 nations, 35 regional families of churches, 12 mission societies, 16 missions training schools. And you can find all this information again on icocleaders.org. Um, so that's, that's sort of God's story in our story. In terms of my personal story, I'm just so grateful to have been able to be a part of it and to see this take shape from the beginning. Uh, it's just a, a blessing to be able, and then to be able to tell those stories. I've been able to go to 40 different countries and see our churches and tell their stories. And uh, it's just, I feel very, um, humbled and honored to be able to do that and to see that. And I am inspired. I, I love our movement. I love our churches, love our fellowship. And I pray that we'll keep the vision that God has. I want to thank you for your commitment and your love for God, for our 35 families of churches, for the ICOC, our family of churches the poor through Hope Worldwide. Thank you for how you serve. Thank you for your connecting through Disciples Today. Thank you for the missions groups and raising up more leaders. But my question to you is, what, will, what story will God write with you? Because he's still writing. But what are you going to let him write with your life? I pray you will write a great, let him write a great story and then you'll pass it on to the next generation. God bless.